you so much again for joining me on this channel. As always, I'm very grateful for all your previous views, likes, subscriptions and shares. And um, the video I posted about the nativity, uh, put it up there. And as always, I thought, oh, that's not very good. This needs improving. But I realised actually there was a huge gap in my knowledge because although um, I think we put across hopefully clearly the reasons why Christians celebrate the nativity, the idea that God becoming flesh and being in the world, it didn't actually explain why Christmas is significant in terms of all the festivity bits and how that came about. So I wanted to address that now. And uh, if you remember, we'd have a little uh, brain boost. Uh, we looked at how uh, the Gospels, which are in the New Testament for Christians, how they explain the birth of Jesus. Only two of them cover it, though. If you remember, Matthew, who was a tax collector, wrote about uh, the Magi, the scholars, bringing the three gifts to Jesus. And Luke, who was the doctor, writes about the shepherds. Um, if you're interested, John just starts talking about how the word became flesh of the incarnation, but doesn't mention any features of the nativity at all. Mark is the shortest gospel, and he just writes about Jesus being in the desert. And boom, off you go with the baptism of Jesus. Um, but I thought we'd try and find out a little bit how the celebrations of Christmas came about. Big winter festivals are very important. And if you go back to the Roman times, they had a god called Saturn and he was the god of the harvest, along with many other things. And uh, between the 17th and 23rd of December, it was a huge celebration whereby there'd be feasting and drinking and giving of gifts. It was a way, I guess, of getting through those miserable months of December. And um, even though the early church uh, didn't have anything to officially mark the birth of Jesus until the third century, it had a huge impact. And at that time, the churches thought, well, actually, uh, even though we're not sure whether Jesus was born in winter or summer or spring or autumn, there needs to be some way of marking this. So what they did is that they looked around and they saw there was Saturnalia around about December time. There were other pagan festivals that happened too. Don't forget on the 21st, of December it's the shortest day and what they did is that they took those uh, and sort of ideas wrapped it all up and said well that's when we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus but what was interesting is that not all Christians embraced it in its entirety and if you look at when uh, England got rid of its monarchy uh, with Charles I there was a time when it was a republic um, Oliver Cromwell and uh, his followers actually banned Christmas and in fact that idea even spread uh, to the Americas. When the pilgrims in the 1600s arrived uh, in North America, they took that idea of not celebrating Christmas with them. And it got me thinking about when a religion bans one of its own practices. Um, and what do you think to that? And that's something you may want to explore and investigate. So, how, and what was interesting as well is that this sort of Puritan hangover, as it were, stayed in the UK up until the early 1970s. In 1971 is when Christmas Day officially became a holiday and actually written into law, which in the history of Christianity, of course, is very, very recent. 1776 was the War of American Independence, when uh, the Americans were able to break free of British colonial rule and establish a brand new country, the United States of America. And it needed an identity. It wanted a fresh start. It wanted a way of actually uh, marking itself out as a brand new country. And a good way of doing it was through festivities. Now, as you know, there wasn't much of festivities going on around Christmas, um, but uh, there was a group of Dutch immigrants uh, in New York, sort of a large Dutch uh, contingent, and they still had uh, connections with Christmas, uh, thanks to a turkey from Bishop, the Bishop of Myra. And um, he was nicknamed Sinterklaas by the Dutch. You can see where we get the word Santa Claus from, or the name Santa Claus. And the people of the United States thought, well, this is quite nice. Uh, uh, the British don't celebrate it. That's a way of uh, being anti-British and starting off a brand new um, festivities. It's a way of forging our new identity. Uh, Santa Claus gives out gifts to kids. This is fantastic. Let's go ahead and do it. But there was a real game changer in the United States with the face of Clement Clark Moore. He was a theologian and scholar and he's credited with writing a poem called Twas the Night Before Christmas. And he sort of took all these ideas of, you know, uh, Protestant uh, Christianity and St. Nicholas and he put it all together and uh, this poem was published. Uh, he named the reindeer, for example, and a vixen and blitzen and comet and dancer and prancer. Um, and it was a huge hit, not just in the United States, but ironically also in Britain and it was uh, swept up by the British public and 
we now need to go to Britain to find out a bit more about Christmas. But before we do that, isn't it interesting about the power of words? Can you think of any other influential texts that have had such a big impact on a religious festival? And what's interesting is that the poem contains nothing about Jesus or nothing about the nativity, but it helped to shape uh, the festival. It's the power of words once again. So here we are in uh, Britain and in 1843, uh, a man by the name of Charles Dickens, famous author, wrote a novel called A Christmas Carol. It was so popular that 13 editions of it sold out in 1843. And it's a story of Scrooge, uh, a horrible, miserly individual who loathes uh, Christmas. He's full of meanness and just uh, he is visited by uh, three sets of ghosts, the ghosts of past. Christmas present and Christmas future and they help him to see the light to be enlightened to find that Christmas cheer there's a wonderful line in the novel where he says I will live in the past present and future and that's an interesting point about Christmas isn't it so people will get together to talk about past Christmases and keep their traditions going they will enjoy the actual present moment and the presents and also they also start thinking about what we do next year for Christmas and it had a huge impact on Victorian society. There's a traditionally the goose had been the Christmas dinner, but actually there's a line where Scrooge says to a kid, "Hey, go get a turkey," and the turkey stuck. Um, this idea of charitable giving as well really resonated uh, with the Victorians at the time, and even today. Uh, charities report that Christmas is still the biggest time where they receive their biggest donations. The idea of sending Christmas cards as well uh, during Victorian times. Uh, Christmas crackers were invented during Victorian times. And it was an absolutely important uh, critical moment. But in addition, the royal family embraced Christmas and the Christmas tree uh, is a significant Christmas symbol. Um, in Scandinavia, and parts of Northern Europe. It was a great idea to bring along uh, an evergreen tree indoors to symbolize life and hope during those dark times. And Prince Albert, who was German, brought with him the idea of the Christmas tree. And there's a very famous image from 1848 that was published of the royal family with Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and their children. And it's interesting because there's no royal crown, there's no images at all that they are royalty. It could just be a normal middle class family at that time. And that helped to popularise the Christmas tree. Uh, and really that idea caught fire. And um, I guess another thing to think about as well is that with uh, Christmas and going back to the nativity is that it celebrates the birth of a child. It's a time of celebration. I guess that's something that many of us can connect to, isn't it? Uh, when a baby is born, it's bought gifts, uh, whether it's little knitted woolly jumpers or whether it's little uh, keepsakes. And uh, I guess if uh, looking back at the nativity, that's where its roots are, isn't it? This idea of a small, helpless baby. And all of us at some point were a small helpless baby and that's something that perhaps we're all able to connect to. Now I confess there was a whole treasure trove of Christmas goodies that I haven't even had a chance to look at and I don't even know the answer to in terms of to why they are connected to Christmas. I was thinking about Santa's Grotto, uh, there an image on the top left. I mean where did that idea come from? Uh, I was thinking on the bottom of that eggnog, why is that a Christmas tree? What's going on? What? I confess I haven't even had eggnog, I don't know what it is but the strange things I know it is associated with Christmas. Uh, in the bottom right you've got the advent calendar and in the top right you've got um, certainly the British royal family. Um, doing a Christmas address. The first one was George V, where he used the radio. So, uh, as always, uh, when you're doing your research, have a look around, have a find out, read some books, just try and find out a bit more about where these different Christmas traditions came from. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching. I'm very grateful for your time. And as always, enjoy your learning. Mm -hmm.